Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. A message from our sponsor, Writing Magazine. Alongside their monthly magazine, Writing Magazine hosts creative writing courses that offer aspiring and published writers something very special. Have you always wanted to improve your writing or break into a new genre? They can tailor their creative writing courses to suit your experience and ambitions. All of their tutors are successful published writers, trained to bring out the best in your writing abilities and help you succeed in your chosen genre. Your personal tutor will build on your existing knowledge and help you to develop your writing through valuable one-to-one feedback and advice in constructive critiques. Writing Magazine are offering our podcast listeners 20% off any of their courses throughout the whole of December and January. To claim your discount, simply email writingcourses at warnersgroup.co.uk with the code PODCAST20 and the course you'd like to enrol on. For full course details, visit their website www.writers-online.co.uk forward slash writing hyphen courses. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with the novelist Howard Jacobson. We spoke to Howard about finding his voice and publishing his first novel as he turned 40, about winning the Booker Prize for the Think the Question, and about the utility of shame and failure when writing. It's a fantastic episode, and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Howard, to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. We have many writers who have uh, reflected that their writing aspirations began young. But yours began at around the age of four, and you had posters of uh, Jane Austen and George Eliot in your childhood bedroom. Um, What's your earliest memory of wanting to be a novelist? I can't remember wanting to be anything else. I'm sure I lie when I said I had George Eliot on my room at age four. <laughs> but I had, a, I had her on my, on my bedroom wall when, when, at an age when people thought it was a very peculiar thing to be doing. And I should have had a footballer or a pop star. Or but I, don't, I just don't remember ever wanting anything else. It was just to do with making words, really, and feeling that the, the only nice thing about being a child I exaggerate the misery of being a child because I was sort of, I was an unhappy, sulky child, I think. And the only nice part that I recall was just making words. And my only sense of, this is all, this is, this is distorted memory that comes from telling tales so often that you now don't know whether what you're remembering is what happened or the last time you told the tale. But I remember um, the first time I shaped a sentence in a way or told a joke that made my mother and her, and her friends, her women friends, laugh. And I thought, this is good. This is a way into the heart of gro- women in particular, but grown-ups. Uh, I thought this is a good thing. And it looks like I can do that. I can make a sentence. And thereafter, there was no other thing. I saw no advantage in being able to kick a ball around or do any of uh, those things. I just wanted to make sentences. And is it right that you found uh, a D.H. Lawrence novel in the school library when you were 15? And then that, that also had an impact on you? Well, I don't think it was a matter of finding. They were there. Uh, these were not days when things were banned or anything. You could read whatever you wanted to read. The excitement was James Joyce's Ulysses, which was freely available on the shelves, and which we giggled and snorted over age 14 and 15 because it had word, words that we weren't supposed to use in it. But yeah, I would have found D.H. Lawrence quite readily early on. And I think my mother recommended me Sons and Lovers to read when I was 14, 15. There was not much of a sense of banned stuff out there. There was grown up literature and there was children's literature. And I like to think I didn't hang around much with children's literature. I was on grown up literature very early, probably not as early as I like to think. Because I know that I secretly see my secrets, my ashamed secrets were not reading banned material, but reading children's material. I'm ashamed that I read Biggles. You might not know who Biggles is now, but Biggles was somebody that boys particularly read uh, at that stage in the early 50s. We read Biggles. He was a pilot in the war, and I kind of enjoyed those, but felt I should not be enjoying these. I should be reading D. H. Lawrence and. and um, and Henry James, well, not Henry James yet. And what was the journey from Biggles to, uh, to Cambridge and studying under F.R. Leavis? I'd been warned that I might find going to Cambridge difficult um, because I was a working class boy and a Jewish boy 
and I poo-pooed all that. I'm not going to find that difficult, I said. Uh, in fact, I did find it difficult. Why I found it difficult, I am puzzling about now. I'm just, I've just finished writing a reminiscence of that period, actually, and spend a lot of time worrying about all that. I went to Cambridge full of expectation, and I hated almost every minute of it. I had a horrible time at university. My wife went to Sheffield University, and when we first met, she said, oh, you went to Cambridge, you're so lucky. I said, I wasn't, I hated it. I said, tell me what Sheffield was like, was that horrible? She said, no, Sheffield was wonderful. So we swapped university stories, and she had always thought how lovely it would have been had she gone to Oxford and Cambridge, and I'd been able to tell her, well, it wouldn't have been horrible for her necessarily because she knew how to mix. For some reason, I did not know how to mix with the boys I met at Cambridge. Not because none of them were Jewish, though none of them, none of them were, and not because they were upper class or anything. Mainly they were working class boys like me. I don't know. I've been a shy little boy. Um, I've been a mother's boy. That's the title of my memoir, by the way, Mother's Boy. I've been a mother's boy. I blushed easily. I got embarrassed. And then I had a period when I was about 15 of breaking out. And I was one of the boys around town. And I thought, all that's behind me. Isn't it great? And then when I went to university, it all came back again. The thing that going red and starting and not having words and not knowing where to look, all that stuff that I thought I'd had gone suddenly came back. And I never recovered myself at Cambridge. I loved being a pupil of Leavis's. Leavis was one of the great critics of that period. Um, he was said not to be a good teacher um, in that reverence or in you know, that a kind of reverence for teaching how you bring people. He didn't bring us on. He just stood there and told us what he thought. And because what he thought was, I thought, so terrific, I could listen to him for hours. And I treasure that and revere that. The only problem with it was he was a stern, he was a stern, forbidding man. And his tastes were to a degree stern. It's often talked about as puritanical and he didn't like enough literature and so on. None of that's true, but it was true enough for it to mix with something in me that was a little bit like that. I was a bit of a disapprover. So what I took away from Levis was more disapproval than he actually gave. I was more of a Levisite than he was. And that stood me in bad stead for a while, I think. I didn't, I didn't read widely enough. I wasn't generous enough. Uh, and I'm, I'm still not. I'm fascinated by, by what you said about that. And I found this, this quote from you, which says, I'm an old fashioned English lit man, straight down the line. It's George Eliot, it's Dickens, it's Dr. Johnson, it's Jane Austen. Did those, do you think that there's an element of that, that that has stayed with you thus far? Or do you feel that you've you've fully kind of renounced that, that leave aside canon? No, I haven't renounced it and I never will renounce it. I think in so far as it's a canon, it's the right one. I think the writers he thought were uh, his most contentious uh, book of criticism when I was the great tradition, the one about the novels when I was when I was there, was that begins with something like the great British novelists are, and there were a bit about five of them. And people were up in arms. You can't say that, but I felt you could say that, and I felt that the people he said who were the great British novelists were the great British novelists. He wasn't saying they were the only ones, but as if he was saying this is a standard by which we might judge others. And there was a thing he was doing, which I couldn't have put into words at the time, but which I actually got. And what it seemed to me that he was doing was he wasn't ranking writers. He was sort of saying he'd come out of the First World War. Um, uh, he'd worked in the ambulance service. He'd been gassed. He came out of the First World War very shocked, personally shocked, and shocked in the way that many people were about what had happened. And his, his project really was... How can we get back what English civilization was? English civilization is measured by writing, by letters, and so on. And he did it by saying, well, this is what, let, let's locate where it was. It was here. This was the greatness of, this is the greatness of Englishness. And I bought that. And I still bought that. And I bought that in a particular way, I suppose, because I was Jewish. And so I was embracing something that wasn't quite my own. And therefore... I loved it more in which, in the ways that people often do when they embrace the culture that's not quite, not quite theirs. Um, I don't say it's alien, I never felt alien to Englishness, but I felt I was going out of myself to find it. And when it found me, I felt very excited by the, this new intimacy that, that I could have. I was helped to by my mother who had never been to university, had never barely been to school, 
but was taught herself to read and read widely and read well. And she read me 19th century poets and she read me Dickens and gave me the classics to read. And the classics that she gave me to read were not all that different from Lewis's classics. I read, I read Georgia, I read The Mill on the Floss because of her, I read Great Expectations because of her. Um, so there was something there that was something, I agreed with Lewis that these were the great writers. And, and when it came to understanding why, why he thought they were great writers, I got it. And I went on teaching these. I became a teacher for a few, reluctant teacher, because I just wanted to go on and write, but I couldn't do it for all sorts of reasons. So I taught, and what I taught was this. I taught my own great tradition. I made no, I made no alterations. I made very few additions. Um, the novelists that I taught were very much those. And when I wasn't teaching those novelists, I was teaching Shakespeare. And I read Shakespeare, not quite in the way that, that Lewis read Shakespeare. He was more interested actually in Shakespeare as a poet. And I was too, but I was equally interested in Shakespeare as a novelist and a psychologist. But nonetheless, my canon was very much his canon. So when I, I went to Australia to lecture and I was very much seen as the visiting Levy site and therefore uh, either admired for that or slagged off for that. When people wanted to get at me, they said I was this old fashioned English, pure prim and puritanical Levy site. And I was, I suppose, and I was proud to be that. And I'm still like that. Levy's also... Um precipitated a short story by you called The Ogre of Downing College. Um, is that right? And could you tell us a little bit more about that sort of... It was a little pamphlet. It was the first thing I ever wrote, uh, apart from scribbles that I did at school for the school magazine. And it came about because when I was at Cambridge from 61 to 64, in the middle of that or towards the end of that, Levis gave a, what became a very famous, notorious lecture on C.P. Snow who was himself a novelist and an academic and also a, a, sci a scientist by that time and made a great thing of talking about, invented the phrase, the two cultures, that we should all be cultured in science and we should all be cultured in the arts. And Lewis had great contempt for this because he felt that C.P. Snow did not know what culture was actually. And it's not just reading a few books and then it's doing, it was a different kind of immersion in, in one civilization then he felt snow understood and he slagged snow off like nothing you've ever seen it really was a scabrous no scabrous is the wrong word he wasn't he didn't use bad language but it was totally and completely insulting and it thrilled me it thrilled me so much i thought this is it this is the great tradition of satire jonathan swift could not have done it better but it was a wonderful event because it was held it was called the richmond lecture it was held annually at downing college I gave one recently. I was so thrilled when I was invited to give the Richmond lecture. My mind went all the way back to Levis's Richmond lecture. He gave the Richmond lecture at this attack on snow um, in, in the Great Hall at Downing. And it was full of dignitaries, undergraduates, but also dignitaries from Cambridge. And one by one, these famous academics have got up and left in protest of what Levis was saying about snow. How dare you? talk about another academic like that. And it was an astonishing controversy. I've, I've never seen anything like it since. The pages of the national newspapers were full of it for a week. I think it was the Spectator. Was it the New Statesman or the Spectator? One of those published a whole edition of its magazine with articles for and against Lewis in it. It was the big, big thing. And I think, my God, I'm here watching this. But the majority of people from very, very well-known academics where I thought very snitty about this and attacked Lewis for being cruel. And I happened to have a taste for cruelty, so I loved it. So he was the ogre of, he was the ogre of Downing College and I invented this little fairy story um, in which it was just, a, yeah, it was just that. It was just a little fairy tale in which I pretended that Lewis was a very wicked man and he was corrupting minds and so on. It's about three pages long. And it was published in a pamphlet with a couple of other essays by some uh, Downing men. And we, put, we printed it ourselves. A friend of mine at Oxford had the wherewithal to get it printed and we distributed it and threw it around ourselves. And I gave it with great trepidation to Lewis, wondering what he'd think. And he said, just be very careful, Jacobson. Be very careful not to admire me too much publicly because you will pay a price for it. 
and I thought this is terrific. I'm a I'm 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 in the service. I am a I'm one of his soldiers. I would I mean I don't have idols. I don't really admire people inordinately. I don't have heroes either. But he was the nearest to something like that. So when he gave me his blessing and warning, I felt that's it. I'm now equipped to go out into the world, looking to the left of me and the right of me for danger. And I found some of that danger. It's true. You are um, a lot of people don't like a lot of people don't like you for being for, for being a Levi site, but also a lot of people did. Talking of, of heading out into the world, could you tell us about Australia, both your initial move there after you graduated and then the, the role that Australia has had in your life over, over the years since then? Is it right that you, you went to cover Jermaine Greer's job initially? I was offered a job at, I was immediately on, on graduating, I was offered a job at the English department at Sydney University. And I was offered that job because I was Levis's latest lieutenant. And this happened to be, there were many places in the world where if you'd been taught by Levis, you could not get a job. They would not touch you. And there were a few in the colonies mainly where they would grab at you eagerly. And Sydney University, my good fortune, was one of them. And I was invited to a lectureship. And it turned out that the lectureship was vacant because Jermaine Greer had vacated it. Um, and she, because she'd come over, she taught at Sydney and she'd come over to get a, a further degree at Cambridge. And I actually met her at Cambridge before I went out to Sydney and she filled me in on what was going to happen. I'd never seen such a staggering looking person in my life. I'd never, I thought, my God, are they all gonna look like that in Australia? Not only was she staggeringly beautiful, which is neither here nor there, I suppose, she was very brilliant, formidable, um, horrendously egotistical. You could not get a word in edgeways. Um, sexually frank in a way I'd never heard in my life. She just sort of, she deposited herself, she, she came to, the, to one of our rooms. I'd just about left, but one of, she, she turned up to the rooms of one of my fellow students, deposited, her, her, deposited herself on the carpet, stretched herself out like a serpent. She was about, about nine feet tall and just sort of described herself and her body and what was, what she liked about it, what she didn't, what was wrong, and so on. So that all we did with all about eight of us just stared at this astonishing creature on the carpet. And I thought, wow, well, is this what they're gonna be like in Sydney? I'm, I'm gonna to have to uh, I'm gonna to have to be smart to keep up with this lot. Many of them were, as it turned out. Um, uh, I did find the men and women in Australia formidable. I'd been told, don't expect them to be like your Cambridge friends. They're not going to be very bright, you know. They were the brightest people I've ever met in my life. They were, as, my students were as sharp as anything. I liked them. Um, the best of them were kind of upper working class kids from the western suburbs of Sydney who were uh, ironical, very, very funny, suspicious, not easily taken in, but passionate, passionate about reading, passionate about all things cultural, really. The great thing about Australia, they had a phrase, don't know whether they use it now, but they had it, the, the cultural cringe, they called it. Because we are so far away, because we are not part of European civilization, we feel an inferiority complex. The inferiority complex that comes with distance. And what that, and, and it was true, it was there, but what that did is they compensated for it to such a degree, so they read more than we'd read. They knew, I mean, there I was growing up in England, in, at Cambridge in so I could have gone any weekend to see every gallery in London. Did I go? No. But these Australians, any of them that had traveled had been, or they'd read, or they knew. To this day, if I want to know, where's that Giotto? Where's that Giotto painting? They, they, an Australian will tell you. They knew everything. They'd listened to music. I was taught to listen. I knew a bit of Mozart. That was that that came. They taught me to listen to Marlowe and Schubert. They were the most, these, and these were my students. I was a kid, I was 22, they were 17, 18, 19. They were highly self-motivated, very clever, very funny. And I loved, I loved being there and I loved teaching them uh, and I loved being taught by them. And I came alive again, all that kind of cramped, red-faced awkwardness that had evolved or re-evolved in, in Sydney just vanished. And it was as if the sun, I arrived there on a boat. I was, I was very young and I was married and I arrived with, with a young wife. Um, 
which turned out to be no fun for her because I was just socially so overexcited by, by being there. I had no time for anything but my excitement at being there. The sun shone and I came out like a flower. It went for three years, I just flowered in Sydney. And when at last I left, for all sorts of reasons, uh, I was heartbroken um, and vowed that I would return again. And I did many, many times. And for a period of about 30 years, Australia was like my second home. I was always there. Then a lot of my friends moved from Sydney to Melbourne because the Sydney English department, which had been full of Levy sites, got booted out the way Levy sites do. And they all trooped to Melbourne. So when I wanted to be back with my friends, I had to go, back, I had to, go to Melbourne, not Sydney. Melbourne was another different kind of Australia that I loved, but I actually adored Australia. I had the most wonderful time. The, diff the difficulty for me for many years was settling back into England and, and reminding myself I was English and, um, and had to do some work because the glory of Australia and the curse of Australia was it's very, very hard to do any work there. You have too good a time. The sun shines, the people are fantastic. The food wasn't any good, but it became good. The wine wasn't any good, but it became good. And I was never going to do any work in Australia. I'm amazed at, at my Australian friends who've become writers or painters, that they find that they're able to absent themselves from the excitement of the streets. To work, you've got to, mainly, certainly if you're a writer, you've got to go in. You've got to go home, you've got to go to your desk, and you've got to do the work. I couldn't leave those streets or that harbour. Will you come out on a yacht with us tomorrow, Howard? I don't like the sea, but a yacht on Sydney Harbour. Will you come out drinking with us? We're all going out to, to Watson's Bay to this wonderful seafood bar. You can't say no to that. But you can say, I was there when I got back to England, I was able to say no to most of what was on offer and do some work. But I would never have worked. I would never have produced my first book had I stayed in Australia. Well, yeah, I was going to say that Wolverhampton, it turned out, was a good place to get some work done because you wrote, um, coming from behind, sort of fictionalising your experiences teaching there. Could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of that novel, how you came up with the idea? Obviously, it's sort of loosely based on some of your own experiences, but how you sort of first put pen to paper and then went about selling the book? It was a novel born of total and complete desperation. I was deeply unhappy. Um, that marriage which had begun um, when we went off to Australia together uh, was no more. It's not surprising. Uh, I was a very bad husband. I was too distracted. So I was coming to the end of a, of a marriage. Uh, I couldn't land a job back in England. The Levisite curse struck because while it worked in Sydney, it wasn't going to work being a Levisite. wasn't going to work back in England. And I'd done no research. You meant to do research. I didn't want to do research. I just wanted to go out and do some teaching. And having done some teaching, I wasn't going to come back to England and then be taught by somebody else. I was beyond all that, above all that. So I just did all sorts of odd jobs for many a year. And then finally, got somehow or other, got myself a job at Wolverhampton Polytechnic. I'm ashamed to say that I was humiliated by teaching in a polytechnic, polytech me, a polytechnic, I, the Levy site who taught at Sydney University, a polytech, it's a university now, and recently they uh, made me deeply ashamed by giving me an honorary degree from Wolverhampton University, which was very, very noble of them. They forgave me, in other words, because I wrote this not very nice novel about being there. But that novel was born out of this sense of what's become of me. I was getting old, I was in my late 30s, I'd part from the ogre of Downing Castle, I'd only published one thing, and that was a book on Shakespeare, good book on Shakespeare, with somebody else, a serious academic book with, with a colleague at Cambridge. So I'd done that and, and, and then had that experience of every first time writer. The book's out, the book's out, today the book's out, and you wake up on the morning that your book's out, and you know the world is, doesn't change, nothing is any different. The sun shines or it doesn't shine, people say hello to you or they don't. Life is the same, you have not changed the world. Being a writer has not made you or anybody else any different. So you get used to that. And I thought, well, nothing's going to happen if I stay a critic. Uh, I didn't want to stay a critic anyway. Uh, and Wolverhampton was becoming so absurd, such an absurd place, really, because they didn't want people teaching English literature the way I taught it. And many of my colleagues taught it. Because a lot of my colleagues at Wolverhampton were old-fashioned Levisites. We all had nowhere to go. And we were all uh, rather high-minded, somewhat elitist, and we wanted to do very highfalutin courses. 
and Wolverhampton, the Polytechnic, was a kind of business place. And they wanted us to do, you know, teach these kids who are going to do business how to spell. We weren't doing that. We were refining their sensibilities. Kids didn't mind. The kids, some of the kids were very good. But the Polytechnic didn't think much of us. We didn't think much of ourselves. And we ended up, as an English department, being consigned to Wolverhampton Wanderers football ground. Because Wolverhampton Wanderers had been a very successful team and great for a little while, a great new ground was built, Molyneux, and then Wolverhampton Wanderers stopped being a very successful team. And there was this spanking state-of-the-art stadium uh, where no one wanted to watch football. So they had an idea, the authorities had an idea, they'd put us in there. Uh, and when we said we didn't want to go, they said, oh, you we'll give you rooms where you can watch the football match. Even while you're teaching, you can see the football match going on. It was sublimely absurd. Um, and I thought, OK, I'm not going to be the novelist I thought I was going to be. I'm not going to be Dostoevsky. I'm not going to be Dickens, if only I'd been Dickens. I'll be a satiric novelist of, uh, who writes the kind of novels I didn't read. I ended up writing the sort of book I would not have read. That was the absurdity of it. But it got me going. It took me years to do it. I learned how to write. I learned the way you do it. I learned how much persistence is necessary. I learned the joy of it. I thought this is, this is the most wonderful thing. Um, I'd often said that the best writers don't start out knowing what they're going to do. They don't start out, if they have an idea, it won't be a very good one and it will get lost. You discover what you want to write in the act of writing. I mean, I'd say all these things based on no experience, just my sense of what I felt reading writers who could write. But it is like that and I loved it. You'd go to the desk, you did not know where you were going to, where you were, what was going to happen and you found yourself writing sentences you didn't know you could write, having ideas you didn't know you'd had, inventing characters you didn't know from where, and it was this wonderful sense of self-discovery sounds a bit grand, and I wasn't doing it to discover myself, so scrub that phrase. It was a discovery of how, how you and language work together, because that's what it is, writing at the best. It's not just you expressing yourself, to hell with you and yourself, you meet language and language isn't you and language has a history and makes demands of you and you have to make a connection with this, with this language. You and language together find out what it is that you are, that the book's going to be. And you lose yourself in a very important way. So, so, so a novel is not what I, my novels are not, neither anybody's good novels, what I think, what I believe. If I find myself saying what I think or I believe in a novel, I wake up in the next morning in a hot sweat, look for it and get rid of it. That's not what it's about. So I discovered in the act of trying to save my, it felt like saving my life. If I don't write this book about how, because I felt ashamed of myself for being at Wolverhampton and I felt ashamed of myself for being ashamed. So there was a, doubly, a double shame. And it became, a, it was a satiric book, a funny book, um, slightly rude book. And it did well. It was published pretty well. It was published right away. So I didn't have the terrible experience some novelists have carting a novel around. I wrote a novel. I spent years writing, probably four or five years writing, just going back to the desk every day and starting from the beginning. I never knew it was going to be like that. And I didn't have a computer. I just had a, a little Olivetti typewriter. Start from the beginning. Start again. Start again. And I thought I'll, I'll spend the whole of my life just starting again, but little by little. The page one does slowly become page two, even though you've spent months on it. Uh, it got written, it was accepted, and um, it was received with some kind of curiosity uh, to begin with, an appreciation, and then it came out in paperback and did fantastically, fantastically well. And I was going, um, but I couldn't stay at Wolverhampton because I'd been too rude to too many people, um, which I'm ashamed of. I'm always ashamed of it. I'm, a, I'm an ashamed person. It's the other reason I became a writer. If you, you have to be a bit ashamed of your life to be a writer. You're going to want to change it in some kind of way. And, and you don't want to change your life if you're happy. A happy person does not become a novel. A happy person becomes David Beckham. A happy person does not write novels. You write novels because you're unhappy, whether you have any reason for being unhappy or not, and ashamed. And I was unhappy and ashamed. Um, I couldn't leave, I couldn't stay at Wolverhampton Polytechnic. I had this novel going, so sorry, I'm taking a long time to say this. So I left Wolverhampton. Um, and at that time I was married to an Australian woman. How could I not be? And she was working in Cornwall 
and running about nine different unsuccessful businesses in Cornwall. And I went to join her and continued to write and wrote my second novel, which was actually set in Cornwall. But it meant I was away. I was up and running, as it were, and never had to go to Wolverhampton again, except to receive, oh, and aren't I ashamed of this, ashamed of my ingratitude, um, not ashamed of them, my doctorate from the now University of Wolverhampton. A message from our sponsor, Vitsu, Melvin's story. We love, love, love our Vitsu shelving. Build quality and ease of assembly is amazing, but it was your service that made the whole process such a joy. So said Melvin from Sydney in this heartfelt message to his Vitsu planner Sophie in London. Love is a word heard a lot at Vitsu. Other verbs just don't seem to cut it. As with any customer, Sophie considered every detail, so Melvin's bookshelves were perfect for his needs. Passionate about good service, she communicates with all her customers directly, wherever they are in the world. Whether in person or on the other side of the globe, Vitsu's planners hold your hand throughout the process, time and again proving that long distance relationships really do work. Every interaction is handled with love from Vitsu. Vitsu's 606 Universal Shelving System is a modular, adaptable kit of parts. It can provide the perfect home for your books and even the desk from which to write one. Visit vitsu.com, that's V-I-T-S-O-E dot com, or request a free brochure via email at vitsu.com by quoting ATN 606. Vitsu, makers of long living furniture by Dieter Rams. Could you tell us about the kind of first decade of your, your life as a fiction writer? Because is it fair to say that, the, that it was sort of in the late 90s that your work rose in profile, the sort of sequence of novels beginning about 98? Would that be fair to, to say that? that, they, that I, had a little, I had a little run. I wrote Coming From Behind. I wrote Peeping Tom, the Cornwall novel. And immediately afterward, both those novels were very, very well liked and did very well. Then I wrote a novel um, that I probably shouldn't, well, I shouldn't have written, and didn't do so well. It was called In the Land of Oz. It was an Aust- No, it wasn't. Uh, that's the trouble book I wrote. It was called Redback. Um, and it, I made the terrible mistake. I was too cocky. I thought, OK, I can do this. And now I'm going to get revenge on all the people who've been not nice to me. You don't write a good book like that. And I didn't. And I much regret it. It was funny in a way. And it wasn't much liked. And I kind of slipped back a little bit. Um, and, then I start- and then I wrote a travel book. All that was fine. I got from 1983 to 1990 with four books, three novels and one travel book, and everything was going fine. Um, But I fell out of novel writing, really, because I started to do television work and enjoyed that, Um, and then fancied myself as a television personality. It was partly because uh, television and film was made of my Australian travel book, which I also wrote in that period called In the Land of Oz. And then I was invited to make lots of TV programs and making TV programs, particularly when you're traveling, um, does not go well with novel writing. There wasn't time. So I had a period of five or six years in which I didn't do much writing, really. So I fell out of the picture as a novel, as a novel writer. I became quite well known at the time as somebody you would see popping up on TV as a guest on a Clive James show or, um, or making my own documentaries. But for a few years, I wasn't a novel writer. I remember my agent, when I then finally, towards the end of the 90s, wrote a novel uh, and my, my agent said it's a bit worrying that they've, they've forgotten you as a novelist Howard the, um, the book trade doesn't really know you I said what what but it doesn't take very long you have to you have to keep it up so I kind of had to remake myself really in the um, in in the late 90s um, and then I did and then by 2000 I was writing a novel every minute really people were begging me to stop writing novels but there was that hiatus, there was that hiatus, yeah, when the life of a media star, uh, as it were. I liked the fact that people would stop me on the streets uh, if I'd been on television the night before and, and ask for my autograph. I was childish enough to think, this is it. In fact, that's not what being a writer is at all. And one of the things that cures that is when a few people stop you in the street and say, I don't know who you are, but I know your face. And I thought, okay, 
if I'm going to be if I'm going to be famous, I want to be famous for what I do. And if I'm just being famous for having been seen, this is no good. So I started to grow up a little bit, put that put that stuff behind and write novels. And is that around the late 90s that you started writing columns for The Independent as well? Yes. And then I wrote those for what did I do? From 2000 to 2016, from 1999 to 2016, I wrote for The Independent, something like 1,200 columns, something like that. Gosh. I, re- I read somewhere that you said um, you liked writing it because uh, it was a place to put your views and it stopped your novels from being too polemical, which is something you touched on earlier. That's correct. In fact, I've always held that a novelist should not... This is the, the, the Levisite novelist in me believed that I should not have been a journalist. I turned my nose up at the profession of journalism. I believed it was not my... D.H. Lawrence, who was a novelist that I adored, of course, and Milan Kundera, who was one of the modern novelists who I did grow to really admire, both said something identical, though they're nothing like each other, both said something identical about novelists and ideas. A novelist has no business having an idea. A novelist has no business having, certainly not an opinion, an opinion. And, and I hold to that. You've got to be bigger than anybody can have an opinion. It doesn't matter what the opinion is, don't have opinions. I actually believe you shouldn't have opinions at all publicly. It doesn't matter what you say at home or what you, what you scream to your friends. Uh, but at least if I was having opinions in, in a column, I wasn't doing that in, a, in, in my novels. And anyway, I wrote those columns at their best as though they were like, like short stories. They often were like little novels. So you couldn't always find me. They weren't like, I wasn't that kind of journalist that goes, I think this, I didn't thunder, I didn't attack. If I attacked, I did it obliquely and subtly. And people didn't always know what I'd written. Um, people thought I was saying one thing when I was saying the opposite. Irony has always been very important to me. And I like the slitheriness of irony, not to fool people, though I don't mind a bit of that, but because in irony, you meet the two parts of yourself. You are, a good writer is in an argument with himself, herself, themselves. Um, and you don't want that argument ever to be settled. And opinion piece uh, articles are sort of represent, you've, this is what you've settled and thought. And mine mainly weren't like that. They were particularly important to write, I think, at the time social media was getting going, because social media is a wasteland of the unironic, um, where you just say what you think. And if it's true that saying what you think is death, because you shouldn't think anything, because you should be in a continuous process of discovering what you think, answering what you think, not thinking what you think, not thinking anything, then anything that can be done to sort of fight, battle, silence the social media, the better. I'm very, very, um, I'm a very old geezer when it comes to the social media. Stop it! Could we talk about your experience winning the Booker Prize? And I was particularly interested to see that, is it correct that when you handed in the, the Finkler question to your publishers, they weren't that enthusiastic about it? Yes, um, that's the case. My, my usual editor, Dan Franklin, who ran Random House, I have a good publisher, ran um, Jonathan Cape at Random House, he ran Jonathan Cape. Quite liked it. Um, well, I'll tell you what had happened. I'd published two novels before that, which I believe are my two best novels. I'd published Kaluki Nights um, in, I think, 2006, uh, and I'd published The Act of Love, The Marvellous Act of Love, even though I say it myself, in 2008. And although Kaluki Nights was picked up and cried out, as it got some staggering with my, my, my editor, um, my, my agent, I'm sorry, rang me up on a Saturday morning and said, you've had a review by A.C. Grayling of Kaluki Nights. It's made me cry. It's so good. And it was just one of those reviews. That you got. When you begin writing, you think if anybody will say, this is the greatest writer, going, this is the great, and it did all that. That's it. It's, this will now win everything. Well, it was long listed for the Booker Prize and people lost their nerve. My next novel, which I think was even better, but it wasn't Jewish and wasn't and didn't have any of that, called The Act of Love, just bewildered them. Um, I, I'm allowed to say that it bewildered everybody and got marvellous reviews and then vanished a bit. So there was a little backlog. My publishers felt, well, here were two books which they'd just published, which everybody thought would be great. Nothing much had happened. So they were beginning to lose a bit of confidence. 
Out comes the Finkler question, which was not as good a novel as those two, which was, I don't think, anything like as rich, uh, good enough, but not as rich as those two. And he sort of said so. And I felt, because I was disappointed that those two previous novels had not done well, and you always blame your publishers a bit, you always do. I thought, okay, if they're a bit, if they're a bit half-hearted about this novel, I will go somewhere else. And my publisher, my uh, Dan said, look, I perfectly understand. I perfectly understand why you say this. Um, so, you know, uh, no hard feelings, go somewhere else. Um, and if, you know, and if you don't find anyone, you're welcome to come back to me. But anyway, go somewhere else and win the fucking Booker Prize. So I've still got the email waiting. And go and win the fucking Booker Prize. So I went somewhere else and hey, presto, won the Booker Prize. So the new, I went to Bloomsbury and Bloomsbury got lucky. I don't think Bloomsbury thought they had a Booker Prize. You know, I'm not even sure. We try not to discuss it. Um, and I'm not with them anymore, but I'm not sure that Bloomsbury thought they had a Booker Prize winner. I'm not even sure they submitted it for the Booker Prize, but somehow or other it was found. It was found and it was liked. And I thank God for that judging panel. Um, every one of whom, when I, when I, when I, when I see them, I, I embrace, well, not now, of course, I embrace nobody at all in the pandemic. Um, and I, I, and I was lucky and people often say, you won it for the wrong novel. Yeah, I won it for the wrong novel. I, I, I still think the Finkler question, they might've been right and it might've been the best novel, whatever that means, that was published that year. If there were any justice, I'd have won the Booker Prize three times. So having failed to win the Booker Prize three times, I settled, I settled for the once. But that is the, that is, that is the story, yeah. Did winning the Booker change um, anything in terms of your career trajectory? I mean, a theme in the, on the podcast when people have won prizes, particularly with novelists, is that they're able to fetch much higher advances, for, for example. Um, did you find that it was more of a bidding war when you went to take your, your sort of subsequent novels up to market? Yes, but I'm never, I mean, I'm not mega in that way because my subjects aren't. Um, I don't write thrillers. Um, I don't write out of the heart of the culture. I don't have a natural, a natural readership that's eager. I um, educated Jewish people like my books, but there aren't, there aren't that, not that many of those. So it did become stratospheric, um, but it was much better than it had been and people knew who I was. Um, a lot of people actually didn't like, even when it won the Booker Prize, a lot of people didn't like the Thinker question. It was very political. It was my most political book. And it broke some of those rules which I've been talking to you about. It did sneak opinions in. I was so angry about how Jews and the whole business of being Jewish today and what an allegiance to Israel might mean and what Zionism was and all that. Uh, I was so angry about the way this was being talked about um, and particularly the way some Jews themselves were talking about it. Very much about Jews being ashamed of being Jews. There are characters in that novel called The Ashamed Jews. So it was very much an attack within the Jewish community at some parts of the Jewish community, which made it to a degree a little bit private. The, the people who, who gave it the prize didn't think so. And lots of people still tell me they, they, they loved that book. But a lot of people did not like that book. Had I won with The Act of Love or Kaluki Nights, I think it would have been, I think it would have been quite different. But what it did do, but, I mean, apart from advances, and it certainly improved those, and it meant I didn't really have to worry much about that. It got me into the world. I have not been translated very much, a few here and there, but the argument had been, he's a difficult writer. I don't see that I'm a difficult writer, but I was considered a difficult writer. Um, I write long sentences, um, uh, long ironic sentences. And they're sometimes hard to understand. Sometimes when I read them from old novels, I don't understand them myself, but I understood them at the time. Um, and I'm judged to be, comic isn't quite the right word, but it will do comic. Uh, and, co and comedy doesn't translate. So my agent would often get, would send me letters from the Dutch, the Germans, the French. We really love Howard Jacobson. We love to publish him, but it's comic and it doesn't translate. Suddenly overnight that changed. I mean, my agent had the most extraordinary night, the night of the booker. He couldn't go to bed because his phones were ringing. America, Canada, Brazil, 
uh, they all wanted to translate the Finkel question. Not on the strength. I mean, it's pathetic, isn't it? Not because it was a good novel, not because they liked it, but because it had won the Booker Prize. And because of that, it had won the Booker Prize, they wanted to publish it. So, I mean, I've got a shelf, which I proudly downstairs, and it's got like 35 different, different translations of the Finkel question. So that was a huge difference. Because although you tell yourself you just want to write your books, and if you've got five readers, that will be enough. I write, there's a, um, what's the Stondal phrase? Not to the happy few, the little phrase about, he didn't sell very many novels from Stondal, and he, he dedicates one of the books to the something few. Um, and I felt that I'm writing for a few people and that's fine. But also the secret is you want to write for the whole world. You really want to write for the whole world. And you actually want to be the only person that the whole world is reading. You want to be the novelist that takes over from all others. So uh, when I started to be translated everywhere, that soothed my um, ambition to be published everywhere. Another question we always ask novelists when we have them on the podcast is, is whether the, how they the physicality of how they write their novels. So that the terms we often hear are whether you're a, a plotter or a plunger. So whether you're someone who's worked out the whole course of the, the plot in in whatever level of detail in advance, um, or whether you, you just jump in and, and follow your nose or some way between those two poles. How does it work for you? I plot nothing. I plot absolutely nothing. For me, a plot would be death. Plot in both things. I don't have stories in that. I have stories because if two people sit and talk, at a table over a coffee and a biscuit. It's a story. Henry James said that that's a story. Um, but I don't have plot, I don't have policemen, I don't have guns, I don't have secrets. I don't, I'm not interested. I'm not, I don't read books that are like that. I don't read thrillers. I don't read mysteries. I don't read science fiction. I don't read any of that. Um, I'd rather read Pride and Prejudice again. Love. That's what you want to read about. Love, jealousy, despair. That's what you want to read about. So not, and not only do I not have plot, um, and not only do I aspire to plot, I do not plot out my writing. I go to my desk not knowing anything. Um, just don't know. And sometimes I don't even know what I'm writing. I finished my previous book. I'm happy with that. I want to write a new book. I'll just sit at the desk and see what happens and push a few sentences. Maybe a sentence about some, atmosphere, some atmospheric was The Act of Love, um, which is a novel about jealousy, which is my favourite novel, my own favourite of my novels, came about because I was walking through Marylebone with my wife at four o'clock in the afternoon and they were clearing the tables of the restaurants. And I said, in, a, in early autumn, and I said, don't you think it's a really sexy time of the day when the tables are being cleared, the waiters are in the street smoking and there's a kind of hazy, it's not quite, lunch has just finished, it's not quite evening, the streets are full of a certain kind of expectancy people will be sitting at those tables and it will be lovers and there will be love talk and it will be people sitting at those tables who shouldn't be there together. And there was just this street in, in Marylebone that gave off this sense of it. And I just thought, no, I said, well, what would it be best? I said, I don't know. So I just sat down the next day and described that, described that scene, just that, what it felt like. What, what, uh, and, I, and, it, and a novel just kind of came up, came up out of it like a, creature from the sea just came up out of it and that's what I love happening not knowing not knowing in the morning that there will be characters you've never heard of and didn't expect to write about by lunchtime they might be married by tea time they might be divorced by 11 o'clock at night it's they do it themselves and they must do it themselves and it sounds magic but it's not magic but it sounds it you must write with light hands I believe if you know what you want your characters to do they won't do it there's, a, there's a, a cricket phrase, isn't it? They talk about a batsman against a certain kind of bowler having soft hands. You must know how to let the bat take the ball rather than to strike the ball, to keep control of it. I think a novelist should write with soft hands and let the characters do it all. I absolutely hold to that. So when other novelists tell me that they plot, I think I don't, I don't get it. Some do, I don't get it. I just don't get it. How can you do? Some novelists I know have things on the wall they have pieces of paper on the wall when, the, because I don't have pieces of paper on the wall and I barely have notes, I sometimes take a lot of notes once I'm going. I do, make, I do need a lot of copy editing because an editor will come along and say, these two people have fallen in love, but they weren't even alive at the same time. Can we fix that somehow? And I go, yeah, you, you, you fix that. 
Um, and you don't make those mistakes if you've got chronology on the wall. You've talked in um, interviews around the publication of Live a Little in 2019 about Beryl sort of arriving in your head fully formed. Is that quite unusual for characters or, um, or not? Not for me. Um, no, that's how they happen. I talked about her like that particularly because she was so fully formed. I couldn't believe that she really was fully formed. And I've been thinking about her and where she's come from. And only recently I was, um, I was in Seaford, don't ask me why, it doesn't matter. And I suddenly remembered that a good old friend, now not alive, who had actually been my, first pub my very first publisher, had a mother living in Seaford. And just, it was only two weeks ago I was there, and I suddenly thought, that's where Beryl came from. Beryl was like her. And I suddenly heard some of the things that she said when I went to meet this formidable woman, the, the mother of my publisher. And I realized they were Berylisms. So things come out of buried memory in, 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 in that way. But what was wonderful about Beryl was you just felt she wouldn't like me. She wouldn't like what I'm doing. She wouldn't like what I'm saying. She has absolutely got nothing, nothing that I could, that we could like about each other. And that was a fantastic freedom. She doesn't say things which are considered acceptable. She has impossible attitudes. And in these tight times when you're supposed to watch everything you say, it was a wonderful to have a character who didn't watch anything that she said, who could say absolutely anything. She still managed to upset some people as though she was a real, I mean, people read novels sometimes as though they're living next door to the characters. Got, you know, I mean, God knows how they read, how they read Macbeth. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't like living next door to the Macbeths. Have these witches round every night. Horrible smell in the garden there. And there. So she was. I'm talking too much. Yes, she came. She she came. She's an elderly woman. She's ninety. She's impossible. She's losing her memory. I am touched by the fact that she's losing her memory. That touches me. That's a novel about the woman losing a memory and the man having too much memory. And there was something neat about the shape of that as it formed. I didn't know I was going to do any of that. And they just rose. So that you do wonder what your imagination is. What is your imagination? This soup, this soup of memory and desire and will and things that you've read and, and you don't know what. And language itself. And because we who write work in language and the language is ours, other people have worked in it and made the words, there are some words I can't use without hearing Shakespeare. So my soup is, on I love you, but it's the soup of any writer, I think. My soup is partly a Shakespearean soup. So every time you dip in, every time you go for, you dip your toe into that water, you know, you are, you are stirring up those associations which are partly yours and partly someone else's. Just, um, we're coming up towards the end of our time, but I just wanted to, um expand a bit on something Rachel asked earlier. It's, it's a rule of the show that we always ask about money and, and people's writing lives and how they've interfaced and, and be as guarded or as frank as, as you want. But over the past few decades, I suppose since you quit that job in, in Wolverhampton, have you, to what extent have you been able to, to make a living from your writing and to what extent have you done other work and, and how have those, those two elements kind of fitted together? I have never been able to make a, a living from my novels. There was a period in which uh, I could have had a modest living from, from my novels, um, but I do like to be free to spend money on going out to eat and going on holidays and things like that. I don't, I don't have fast cars. I mean, I hate all that. Um, I don't have snazzy suits, but you know, I have a lot of shirts. I like shirts, but I don't have expensive shirts. So I'm not an expensive person, but I, do, but, um, but I like to live okay. Um, and to have lived on my novels would have meant pulling in too much. So I needed my columns for the independent. I needed my television work. Um, it was my equivalent really of what the majority of writers do, which is to um, teach at a university or do uh, creative writing, most of them, a number of them who are teaching creative writing. I couldn't have done that. I just couldn't have, I couldn't have done that. I have kind of fellowships here and there and I have you know and I'm visiting professors but you never really do anything with those and you never make any money from them so I've always done it by by writing but since I left Wolverhampton in 1983 I've kept myself alive okay by writing but not novels it's always needed something else which sometimes I think is good for me we've discussed that whether 
doing a different kind of prose leaves your novels to be themselves? Um, or would it have been wonderful just to be, you know, a Henry James kind of novel and just concentrate on the novels and that's, and that's that? A final question from me, looking back again to 1983. Um, I found a quote from you where you said that when you first began, several Jews told me to my face that they regretted my writing about being Jewish at all. Your novels now are celebrated for their exploration of Jewish identity. What do you think changed in sort of the intervening period? I never thought I would write about being Jewish. Um, I was, was I embarrassed about being Jewish? No, not embarrassed, no. But my father had always, my novel J, which is about putting your finger to your lips before you use even a word that begins with a J, uh, the story of Jews having been expelled from a country and Jewishness and the few Jews who live have to put their finger on to their lips before they even use the word say the letter J, is based on what my father was like. He always used to say, just stay stum. Don't be ashamed of being Jewish. Don't apply. If anybody insults you, you know, you deal with it or get me and I'll deal with it. But you don't have to go around advertising it. So there was that feeling of, after all, when I was growing up, you know, the, 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 the German horror was only a few years behind. I, I mean, the, the camps had not been liberated when I was born. So we were not that far from it. Um, geographically or as far as time was concerned. So there was a reason to be watchful, we felt. And I thought, well, I'm not going there. And none of my heroes were Jewish. The novelists that I loved were not Jewish. Um, Levis wasn't Jewish, though he was married to a Jewish woman, in interestingly. So I saw no reason to go in that direction. But it, but, and I've been writing about this in my memoir. The only way I was able to write coming from behind about, my, about Wolverhampton Polytechnic was when I realized the one ingredient missing as I started to write this satire about feeling my life had come to nothing. And here I was, this absurd person teaching in the West Midlands, a horrible, it's horrible then, it's lovely now. Um, the thing that was missing, I only discovered when I thought, it's, this is a, he's got to be a Jew. My hero's got to be a Jew and he's got to be very Jewish. And I gave him a very Jewish, a very kind of Jewish name. Sefton Goldberg, a very kind of squishy Jewish, not a heroic Jewish name. Um, uh, and that, that was the liberal, th at that moment I realized that's what had stopped me writing before. I was trying to write like a non-Jew. I was trying, to, all my models were non-Jewish and I was in a kind of way, although I thought personally I wasn't in hiding, as a writer in my prose, I could hardly call myself a writer because I hadn't written. The reason I couldn't written, I couldn't write was because the writing I was trying was concealment. I wasn't writing to open up anything. I was writing to hide the fact that I was Jewish. And once some, God knows what, aid, desperation, made me realize I couldn't do that. And once the Jewishness was kind of admitted, it flowed. There were people who wished I hadn't done it. My dad said, did you have to? A lot of people said, oh, is, is um, washing dirty linen in public? There's very much that feeling. They don't say that anymore. Once I won the Booker Prize, there was no, oh, we're so proud of you. That was that. There was that, that sense that I'd um, given away the secrets of Jewish life. Not that everybody didn't know all that anyway. They'd read about them in American novels. They read about them in Jewish comedy. Um, I was giving away no secret. Um, but there was a feeling, mm, maybe you shouldn't do it, Howard. But that's gone, up, gone a long time ago. Gone a long time ago. And it's a good job I did it because I'd never have got going otherwise. I'd never have got going pretending to be um, um, a middle, an upper, upper middle class, country house English novelist. I was getting nowhere being that. Brilliant. Well, look, that's a, a good place for us to end. Thank you for being a fantastic guest on Always Take Notes and wishing you all the best with your memoir and with all your other projects going forward. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you both for good, probing, interesting questions and a nice conversation. Thank you. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Howard Jacobson. He's not on social media, but information about his work can be found on his author profile on the Curtis Brown website. His forthcoming memoir, Mother's Boy, A Writer's Beginnings, will be published by Jonathan Cape in March. We wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there.
it helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. If you pledge $10 a month, you get a free two-month trial to Otter worth $26 alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note-taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organising interview material. You also get access to a series of mini-episodes from previous guests on the show, in which they answer three revealing questions. The latest episode features Holly McNish, and here's a snippet. What trait should a good poet have? Um, I think the main good trait that a poet should have is to have an enthusiasm about other people's poetry. I think it's hard for me to take somebody seriously as a poet if they've got no interest in listening to or reading any other poet's work. So I think an avid reader. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what were your takeaways from the interview with Howard? Yeah, I enjoyed talking to Howard and I managed not to bring up my uh, Mancunian connection to him. So you're welcome, Simon. That's a first. (laughs) Uh, Particularly really learning about the arc of his career uh, before the Booker Prize and before he became the literary juggernaut we know now. And I have a proof of his memoir on the desk in front of me, which I'm looking forward to reading over the Christmas and New Year break. I think, again, that what was fascinating for me is, is just to be able to sort of talk to someone who's done something like winning the Booker in this case and mean, you know, just get a sense of like what it's like, what effect does it have on you, really to get the insight of being in that kind of experience. And I think the other thing that struck me um, just through looking back on this is the fact that, yeah, he was um, turning 40 when he published his first novels. This is all something from the, the kind of second act of his life that he's done. And um, you know, he could have just been another humble TV presenter if he'd if he'd pushed on doing that but I thought it was it was fascinating and yeah great great to add him to our our ever-expanding roster of distinguished novelists Mm. Uh, what have you been up to Simon um I well we're recording this a little bit before it goes out because we're getting it done before Christmas I've been trying to um clear my desk before the end of the year which has been more or less successful um as (laughs) as civilization collapses around our ears but it's been uh yeah it's good i've been uh working on an edit for the lrb and again on a uh discussing with my editor about the next steps of a piece for 1843 and um clearing some time next week to to do some work on a book proposal so so that's been that's been good but looking forward to having some time off assuming that we're not all completely confined to our homes what about you rachel (laughs) a jolly prospect uh yes similar to be honest Christmas coverage uh we had a few year end lists rounding up things like books and tv and film and podcasts which are always by far and away the most popular uh the most popular pieces that we run every year so I should just pivot to listicles really uh that should be my career from from here on in have you um is your is your course fully wrapped up yet is your is this viva going to be happening I, I believe so i've not heard any more about it but i uh am putting that to one side because out of sight out of mind basically um fair enough yeah. all right well look thank you to everyone who's listened to always 10 eggs this year and wishing everyone a great end to 2021 and a, a fantastic 2022 This has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Acom. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our graphic design is by James Edgar. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes. On Twitter, at Take Notes Always. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to get in touch with us on our website or leave a review on iTunes, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.